introduce my colleague Rob Callingham, who's a lead GP at HMP Haverick and is passionate about dependence forming medications or the lack of them. And uh, by the way, I wanted to declare I have no drug company sponsorship. Uh, they wouldn't sponsor me because I keep stopping them. So um, <laughs> over to Rob, thank you. Yeah, I'll make the same declaration. Um, I've got a fair reputation for stopping meds in, in HMP Hatrick. Um, this statement, worth a read, is on a website called Reddit, and it's all about um, pregabalin and how good it is. And if you actually go onto the Reddit site, it's R E W D I T. There's loads of stuff on pregabalin, quetiapine, anything you want to look at from the user's perspective. Um, and it's, it's very clear why so many people in prisons want it. I um, don't know how many of you are on the BMA list server. Um, if you are, I hope you've seen the statement, as it were, from Jerry Bolger, um, summarising his view on uh, prescribing some uh, sedating drugs to people so from the Just because he's a mic, because they're fucking back and struggling. Thank you. Okay, just, right. Uh, okay, I've tried to remember to speak into this thing. Um, yeah, Jerry's statement is really, really good. It summarises uh, the effects of giving sedating drugs to people with a, with a drug problem. And worth a read, it takes it through from I'm a heroin addict, I've got mental health issues as a result of my substance misuse. Um, so someone's prescribed me um, some benzos, then some pregabalin to help the anxiety, then some metazapine to sedate me, um, and then an antipsychotic because I'm starting to get real behavioural problems. Now, actually, I don't care about anything. Um, I can't remember most things, and I'm disinhibited, so I tend to use the knife that I carry, and I'm now back in prison for a long stretch. Um, oh, and I've gained weight, and I've got diabetes. And it's a really good summary as to um, what, what we're doing. Uh, let's move on. Um, okay, big question is, are we helping or are we harming our patients with our prescribing? Um, we certainly have prisoners, prisoners who have mental health issues, physical health issues, who need medication. Um, but I think there's a very, very good chance, oh, lost a slide somewhere, um, very good chance that our medication is actually harming prisoners. Um, there's so much sedation, uh, we're stopping people thinking, we're stopping people making progress towards rehabilitation. Um, the side effects are there, um, there's trading, there's abuse, and of course there's the drug-related deaths. Um, as we all know, drug-related deaths have increased significantly, um, the pregabalin and the gabapentin figures are quite scary. Um, some of the drugs on there are ones we think are relatively safe. Um, Propranolol has been running around about 40, 50 for quite a few years. I'm not quite sure how that's, that's involved. Um, antidepressants, um, four or five hundred deaths a year. Um, I, again, I don't know if those, how many of those are suicides, how many of them are involved in um, amitazapine as a res respiratory suppressant. Um, and I don't know how much the deaths are due to the prescribing or despite the prescribing. Um, why do they seek uh, tradable medications? It may well have a genuine, uh, appropriate clinical indication. doesn't necessarily mean we should be prescribing for that. It may mean that the prescriptions that are uh, clinically appropriate are too high risk and shouldn't be prescribed. Um, there are usually all safer alternatives. What they want, they may have neuropathic pain. Um, uh, doesn't necessarily mean we should be giving them pregabalin. Um, they may want to self-medicate, -medic or they may be used to self-medicating for pain, mental illness, or distress. Um, and taking heroin, a lot of them will tell us, oh, there weren't a pain in the community because they were taking heroin. may well be true. It may, may be stopping the pain, um, maybe stopping them thinking. We, we see pa patients all the time who, um, they tell us, oh, I've been bereaved recently, I can't get over it, I'm really struggling. Then we find out it was five years ago. The drugs have been stopping them thinking, stopping them processing that. And so they're still they're still struggling to come to terms with it. Um, taking drugs is probably normal. And they're actually carrying on with their usual practice. And they want to carry on with that. And they don't see why they should change just because they're in prison. Uh, lack of coping mechanisms. They can't deal with life. They come across a crisis. OK, you go and take drugs. Or you get violent. You get angry. Uh, that's, that's normal. Pleasure. They may want to just do drugs because they enjoy it. And again, we get plenty of them. No, I just don't want my methadone in prison. As soon as I get out and back on heroin, I have no intention of stopping drugs. I just want to carry on. Um, trade, um, yeah, there's a good money to be made. Pregabalin varies prices. Anything up to the highest I've ever heard, about £50 um, a capsule. <coughs> it's come down from there um, more recently, but that was a few years back. 
Um, being bullied to obtain drugs, even to come and get drugs. I've seen a few patients that come in, they're trying to get drugs, and I can see the relief when I've refused. They sort of, all oh, right, okay, and, and off they go. Um, and I suspect they're being forced to come to get them because, oh, I've got, you've got a good reason, go and get them. Um, many prisoners have a past history that is mentally distressing to them. They've been abused um, when they were younger, other mental distresses. Uh, a lot of them will report they've got this, and it may be true, with usually no way of telling whether it's true or not. And they will have probably used illicit drugs and alcohol to block it out, um, both prescribed and um, straight illicit drugs. They will want that to continue in prison. It's much easier for them to be on something that stops them thinking, stops them ruminating, than actually have to, having to deal with their problems. Um, it replaces the need for coping mechanisms because if you're chilled out, you really don't care what's going on in the world. It's, life's a lot easier. The sort of chemical fog blanket that they have in the community, they'd lose it when they come to prison, um, and that's what we see when they're sitting there in front of us. Oh, I'm distressed, I can't cope, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I'm self-harming. Um, and they need something to actually help them to, uh, to shut themselves down again. Um, they often tell us how oh, they can't sleep, they're ruminating. That's probably normal for where they're at. Um, this is how I've put it to um, some of my prisoners. Um, that's them in the community. They're in their bubble, in there with the drugs, the alcohol, maybe prescribed drugs in there as well. And they see this as how you know, life is. It's really, really quite good. The world's shut out, all the horrors, the terrors. Um, and that's how they perceive it with their drugs. The world may be a bit more like that. Yeah, actually may be quite scary. Um, you know, it may not be a good place, and so nothing like as good as they perceive it. Um, and, but all the horrors have been kept at bay in their perception. They then come to prison, and we stick a big pin in their bubble by stopping all the illicit drugs. Um, and this is a chap who we often see. Apologise if it's I don't think it's sexism. I'm just used to dealing with male prisoners. I don't work with female prisoners. Um, so that's what we see so so commonly. Um, it may be um, actually a complete black. He's been in prison umpteen times. He knows he comes in, I'm anxious, depressed, give me my metazapine. Um, I'm ruminating, I can't sleep. Um, I'll, I'll self-harm, I'll kill myself if you don't give it. It may be completely genuine. Um, can be drug-related. Certainly people coming to prison first time. If I went to prison tomorrow, I think this would be me straight across. Um, but for a lot of our prisoners, this is where they're at. So, what do you do with him? What does he do with himself? How does he move forward from this? Um, the options, okay, manage without sedating chemicals. Some of them will be trying to do that. They may be sitting in their cell, withdrawn from everyone. They may be self-harming. Um, they may want to actually cope and change and may really struggle. Um, they may be presenting to us all the time, wanting drugs, wanting help. Uh, my prison, they come in, uh, and if they're in this sort of state, they'll be put on a waiting list to the primary mental health team. And the waiting list is weeks long. The highest risk is in that first few weeks. And to me, we should be putting that support in straight away, giving them the help, and actually have them to move forwards. Um, obtaining illicit drugs and alcohol, of course, is fairly routine in prisons. Um, perpetuates the bubble state, as does giving them sedating drugs. Um, if we want to help them move towards the ultimate goal, which is leading a functional life, rehabilitation, we've actually got to think, is our prescribing actually helping or is it making things worse? Um, many prisoners are already on the uh, sedating drugs when they come to prison. Um, worth having a really, really good look at the um, SCRs when they come in. Um, I've seen, I'm, I'm in a cat I don't get senior receptions now when they first come to prison. Um, but very often when I'm looking at the records, saying, oh right, yeah, he was on metazapine, but that was in January, and he came to prison in April. He would have been off his drugs, but he's just been re-prescribed to them <coughs> under, under medicines optimization. So that really needs a, a closer look than sometimes happens. Historical prescribing isn't appropriate. We should, I distill the GMC um, good practice guidelines down to, is it clinically appropriate and is it safe? And I try and run that across all of every prescription I do. Um, and that's what we should be doing with them. It shouldn't just be because he's already on it. I mean, what I do with my new receptions is I look at them, um, okay, he's on drugs, which I think are a bit of concern. I prescribe them long enough to see him, look into the background, see why he's on them, and try and reconcile it. Is it appropriate and is it safe? Um, and then we have the discussion about, no, you're not having this, which, of course, gets quite 
problematic, as I'm sure most of us know. Um, I go through all the records and I summarise it. The big problem, of course, with System 1 is that it's all free text. Uh, so it's really, really difficult. I put all my medication documentation under medication management plan so I can find it, it's visible, and it makes it much easier when they're arguing with TOS next time I see them. Um, I audited the last six months of uh, prescribed sedating drugs in prison, looking at um, the substance misuse um, history of the patients involved. As you can see from that, it's almost universal. Um, that we're prescribing these drugs to uh, some misused patients. Some of them, I'm sure, have a mental health history. Maybe most of them, um, but the medication may not be appropriate. Okay, we're prescribing the sedating drugs. Don't assume it will be taken as prescribed. Metazapine, for example, um, in the community we get tolerance to metazapine over a couple of weeks and sedation wears off. In prison, they want this for years and years. And I just assume that either means they're taking other sedating drugs to perpetuate the sedation. Um, works really well with methadone in that way, so I turn the lights out, they say. Um, or they're taking two or three tablets one night and nothing for a couple of nights, taking a you know, bigger dose then. Um, not in session medication, we know it's not effective at preventing diversion, but certainly some people uh, will believe that. Um, psychiatrists in my prison have a total conviction that if it's supervised, they're going to be taking it as prescribed. Um, we try to put medication in possession so we can do medication spot checks to look for diversion, and we found that quite effective. Um, diversion of medication puts other prisoners at risk. Really, really important. Stop the medications then. I see from documentation in some prisons that it's all right, naughty boy, smack on the wrist, don't do it again, put it um, supervised. Um, we think that's nuts. We think, right, they're not taking it, they're diverting it, stop it. They don't need a reduction because they're not taking it. Uh, that's our approach. If you disagree, yeah, talk to me. Um, intoxication and illicit drugs puts the patient at risk. Um, is it safe and appropriate to continue with it? Um, make sure the patients make an informed choice if you decide to continue with their medication. Um, we had one prisoner died, uh, I forget now, I think it was a couple of years ago, we still wait for the coroners, um, on gabapentin. Um, he had a really, really good clinical indication. He'd had um, some quite severe intoxications, including a respiratory arrest at a previous prison. Came to our prison and did really, really fine for nine months, then he was dead. Um, and after the event, we actually found out from the um, prison that, oh, he's always off his head, um, and they'd never told us. Um, fortunately, I documented the patient that, you know, you've got to, if you take doing illicit drugs, it'll be stopped, and also it might kill you. Um, unfortunately, it did in the end. Um, Drug-seeking behavior. They're, they're often presenting with a clinical indication. It may be difficult to disprove that, like neuropathic pain. Um, you can treat the condition appropriately, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean giving what the patient wants. Uh, we've got one who's been going on at me for three years now that I'm not treating his venous alcohol pain. Um, I've had multiple consultations with him, offering him everything that's appropriate, but he's not getting his pregabalin. Um, and he sits in the waiting room, he's in having dressings three, four times a week, and he tells all the prisoners how dreadful I am. <laughs> Which is fine, I'm getting used to it. <laughs> Um, document the risk clearly on system one. Very, very often I go through the records and I find out, oh, he was diverting his pregabalin last year and he's been restarted at another prison because it's free text. Um, we try to document things so we can actually see it. Um, I put polydrug misuser um, or harmful alcohol use, something like that as a major problem so it's visible. Um, we record diversion as you know, misuse for prescription only drugs. We also put the high priority warnings, you know, the, the exclamation marks. You can actually make, that comes up in the right border, ours pulse is red at you um, and it shows red up on the home page, which just makes that bit more visible. Um, we also include in there anything like you know, threatening behaviour, uh, any, any warnings that are warning to staff and risks with the patient, suicide, etc. As I said, I put all my documentation, the decision making about medications and the medication management plan. Um, that way all the consultations are linked, I can find it. You can link more than one problem to a consultation as well. So if you're talking about their diabetes, um, you can link the medication managing with that if you just want to have that sort of summary. Um, I use repeats to manage the duration of treatment to just look at what we're doing. 
Because so often we know what it's like, you know, you find someone who's been on medication for the last three years and no one's quite sure why it was even started. And I try to control myself on that. Um, very important to form the community GP of changes to medications. Totally by chance. I've had three feedbacks from prisoners in the last two weeks saying that I've stopped the medication last time they were in Havrig and their GP has had a letter from me saying, you know, don't prescribe Pregabalin. Um, and actually they're all three fine with it, but the GPs actually use my letter as grounds not to prescribe it. I try to do that when I stop the medication and at release because often they've moved on to different prisons then. Um, but it's worth doing even if it doesn't, doesn't work. Um, okay, so dating drugs, yeah, it's normally prescribed to prisoners who are likely to abuse them or trade them, even if it's appropriate to be prescribed to them. Um, is it safe for them to be on multiple drugs when they're released in the community, on top of their uh, methadone, their illicit drug use in the community, the alcohol? If it's not going to be safe for them to be given you know, months of supply of equitapine and metazapine uh, when they go out, should we be starting them in prison? And that's something I, I really think we should. We need the risk-benefit <coughs> analysis in prison needs to take into account what's going to happen when they're released. Um, I think for quite a few prisoners coming in in a state where they can't function and they can't engage with, say, um, mental health or substance misuse teams, um, because they're so agitated, they're so struggling about drugs, there probably is a case for saying, right, let's give them something sedating short term, which may be weeks, maybe months, while they're working on therapy to go forwards. Um, but all the ones we've tried with that got transferred out and are probably still on the drugs years later that I started them on with that good intention. Um, it's difficult. Review the history of substance misuse. Um, I go through the records, I look back to what were they doing when they came to prison this time and last time the time before. And so when they're sitting in front of me saying, you can't stop my programming and I'm not doing drugs. Well, you were doing them when you came to prison two months ago. Ah, but I'm not doing them now. But you will do all, almost certainly in the future. And every time you've been in prison, you've been intoxicated, etc. Um, I take grounds that they're using drugs when they come to prison. They will very probably misuse any drugs that's tradable whilst they're in, if we're prescribing it to them. Um, may be wrong. I've said we've had a few cases where we have seen a major shift moving forward. And we've gone with that basis. Um, I think we've had three in about four years, and two of those three have come back with their illicit drug use for full burn again. Um, look out for intoxications. Make sure you're liaising with the prison, because the prison, our prison staff are so used to intoxications, they don't tell us about the mild ones, so we don't know they're happening. Um, make sure the prison knows that it's really joined up work. Uh, very, very important. The PPO reports all go on about poor communication, and. You know, to prevent deaths, we need to address that. Medication spot checks, you have said, really effective. Um, take positive actions, don't let things run. Look at the long-term risks as well. We had one guy come in on quetiapine and metazapine for the last year. His weight had gone from 73 kilos to 113. Um, I thought that was a significant weight gain. A psychiatrist said, no, that's fine. Um, I wasn't too sure about that. I left them to do the prescribing. Um, Look at the pattern of sedating drugs. As we all know, so often it's you know, multiple drugs, metazapine, pregabalin, quetiapine. Look at that pattern. Is it appropriate? I suspect in most cases it's not. Um, look at the cautions with the drugs. Because very, very often they're prescribed or they've got hold of them somehow without the cautions being considered for the patients. The cautions are very, very common in the prison population as well. Liver impairment. So many of them have got hep C, they've got liver damage should we be prescribing the medications? Um, the ones on metazapine, I don't know why, but I seem to get an increased number of those who had a history of seizures. Uh, maybe coincidence, maybe they've been trying to get clonazepam in the past, I'm not sure where it comes from. Um, gabapentinoids for epilepsy, it's only licensed for focal epilepsy, and I think, I couldn't get this confirmed. Um, directly from any proper literature, but I think that should only be initiated in a tertiary centre. Um, consider QTC prolongation, because a lot of these drugs would prolong QTC, and it's often overlooked. They're often on methadone as well, obviously. Um, night sedation, we're all asked for night sedation probably every single day we're working in prisons. In 2011, in Havering, um, there was a GP who thought they should be given night sedation if they couldn't sleep. Um, when that GP left, they, it was audited by the people who took over, and one of four prisoners were on long-term sedation. 
Um, and it was a friend of mine who had gone in there, and he said he's never seen a prison like it. He's walking around it in the summer in July, and there's prisoners lying on the grass asleep through it in the middle of the day from their, their soppy clone. Um, insomnia can certainly be a reflection of the environment. It's a noisy place, it's not a great place to be. You're locked up many hours a day. It's going to impact on your sleeping pattern. Um, the lack of chemicals may well be causing their um, sleep problems. I only give night sedation for an acute crisis um, or for an opiate detox and try to minimise it. Um, we certainly don't prescribe for chronic insomnia. Um, I think we're just replacing the illicit drugs or alcohol with sleeping tablets. Um, we offer relaxation, we offer sleep hygiene. Does anyone offer lavender oil? I know they used to at Forest Bank. Yeah. Does it work? Why did you stop that? I don't know. I don't know. Snorting it. They were snorting it. <laughs> <laughs> is it is it a prescribable item? Yeah. 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 I don't think it's prescribable, but certainly some prisoners actually found it effective. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was stopped at our prison because it um, put the dogs off the centre. Yeah. Right. So, okay. And they made hooch. <laughs> okay, so what drugs are abused? Um, are there any surprises on that list? And is there anything anyone else would add to the list? Yeah. Um, you get an adrenaline rush for them and you use them for tattooing. It's a springy needle. There's a manufacturer's problem anywhere with it at the minute. Yeah. 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 Um, what we do with EpiPen is we check the kitchen, see what foods they're ordering, and when they get some muesli leaf for their nut allergy, we stop the EpiPen. <laughs> <laughs> Build up drinks, um, we get massive demands for it. Um, we'll only prescribe it um, when it meets the criteria. I don't think I've ever met anyone who met the criteria in the last four years. Um, so yeah. And we say, all right, go, we'll get you a better diet from the kitchen to improve your weight, etc. We just audited it. Out of the 13 people who are on special medical diets from our kitchens, um, two of them were possibly kosher and not trading it. The rest of them were all either blagged it or were trading it. One guy was down as diabetic and had been for the last four years. He'd never been diabetic. No idea how he got his diet. Um, TCAs, uh, especially amitriptyline. Amitriptyline, of course, shouldn't be prescribed for depression. It's, you know, as per the BNF. Um, it's prescribed for pain. I've lost a fair few uh, patients in the community in the drug team from taking amitriptyline as a sleeping tablet. Uh, like most drugs that are abused, I'm sure, if one doesn't work, you take a handful. And it's, it's high-risk stuff. Um, it's quite popular. We're still using the RCGP 2011 guidelines and giving them triptyline, which is nowhere near as popular, and they, most people don't like the switch across. Um, where people have been happy on amitriptyline in the past, they tend not to take the nortriptyline. It is as effective for pain, but it doesn't cause the sedation. Um, the sulipin, um, we take everyone off that, it's too high risk. Trazodone, it's a lot less popular than metazapine, but I've come across two or three patients who prefer it. Um, and again, they're ones where I'm pretty sure it's there after the sedation. Uh, venlafaxine, come across two prisoners using it, and you can get an amphetamine type hit if you take a, a big bolus with it. Um, the two patients I had really would not take it NIP, and I think they get the tolerance to it, they lose that hit. Um, duloxetine, I think last count was 50 something we prescribed it for for pain, two of them stayed with it. Um, it really seems to be very, very unpopular. Now, I don't know whether there's a negative effect with it or something, or whether it just doesn't do anything, but it's, it's more unpopular than sertraline. Um, SSRIs, if you take several SSRI tablets and alcohol, apparently you can have a hit. I've not come across any problems with it in prison. Metazapine. Oh. Um, I really don't like metazapine. It's so heavily prescribed. My mental health team really, really like it, and so do my psychiatrists. I try to um, address the issue. It's highly sought after for sedation, as we all know. It's licensed for depression, but not for anxiety or insomnia. Um, one of the common side effects, of course, is anxiety um, and disturbed sleep. So a lot of people taking it for their anxiety and insomnia probably actually aren't getting what they want for it. Um, 
National guidelines, the Safer Mental Health Prescribing, um, recommends we don't use it for sedation, and there's been, I think, CMO advice on that as well. Um, the maximal, do maximal sedation is on 15 milligrams. In the community, you get tolerance to that within a couple of weeks. Um, in prison, they seem to quite like that dose, and I suspect they take variations on, you know, take some for a couple of days, and, or several for one day, and none for a few days, or something like that, or take it with other sedating drugs. Um, methadone, I'll say, it really, really is effective I'm told. Uh, side effects, anxiety, suicide, 10 times the incidence of suicide um, higher than with SSRIs. Disturbed sleep, apparently if you take metazapine, I don't know how much you take to achieve it, um, and then force yourself to stay awake, you will trip because you're getting the disturbed type um, dreams coming while you're awake. Um, not had anyone actually report that, that's from, um, from Redis again. Um, it'll potentiate the effects of illicit drugs and alcohol, and you're more likely to come to harm if you're on it, you know, f falling from um, taking alcohol with it. Respiratory suppressant, it'll cause psychotic symptoms, which is curious that it's often prescribed with antipsychotics, um, causes weight gain and diabetes, uh, and the cautions are there. Um, I've done multiple audits on it, and the link with some misuse is persistent. I also audited it in um, Forest Bank in about 2011, 2012. Same link up with some misuse. Um, our medication spot checks in the last six months, we've uh, done 20 metaspine spot checks, 15 of them have failed, um, which I think says everything about how much it's traded or how it's used, that maybe that they get a week supply and then take three tablets one night. Of for the next, something like that. Um, the commonest recorded clinical indications are anxiety and insomnia, which is really good practice. Um, given the, um, the abuse and the risks, I think it should really be prescribed in prison. Antipsychotics, my views are based on what happens in HP Forest Bank, um, and it's not necessarily a re review of our psychiatry, it's what people are coming in and the records that are on System 1 already. Most of them don't have a diagnosis or a care plan. Um, most, I audited all of them out of the 24 patients with antipsychotics. Three had a diagnosis. One of those I put on. The other two were self-reported and actually were incorrect um, according to the mental health and psychiatry reviews. I think most of the prescribing is off-label, but without a diagnosis, we don't really know why they're being prescribed it. There's usually no risk-benefit um, assessment going on. Um, the majority of them have a history of some misuse. Um, I certainly the prescribing I'm seeing is giving me a lot of cause for concern. Olanzapine, I've been asked for it repeatedly as a sleeping tablet. Um, oh, my pad mate's on a sleeping tablet, I want one. Well, what's he on? Olanzapine. Um, Quetiapine, I've not been asked for it directly as a sleeping tablet, but people want it as a chill out tablet. Whether on just say um, a single tablet a day, they'll report. Um, taking bits of it through the day, like taking um, diazepam multiple times a day. It seems to be what they're after is that chill out. Um, we've also had people using it proactively, they've said, to stop the um, psychotic symptoms from NPS. Um, I think it may be a bit more like taking diazepam when you're coming off crack, a crack binge to block that, that uh, crash. Um, there's a service specification come out, Integrated Mental Health Service for Prisons, came out in, I think it was March, um, and that brings in the psych Royal College of Psychiatry standards and the networking and looks to go forward. I think that's going to be really positive. Um, the mental health of ad adults and um, contact criminal justice is all in there and I think we really need to go forward. A lot of the prescribability of antipsychotics um, I'm quite concerned about. We know they're heavily traded, um, but the management of it needs to be with the psychiatry and mental health team has got to be a, a coordinated approach. We use an MDT approach, we've got mental health, a substance misuse team, we've got nurses, we've got psychiatrists, we've got the GPs, we meet once a week and hopefully we move forward and address these issues. Okay, um, opiates, uh, prison pain formulary, um, the RCGP is safe for prescribing. The BNF does list cautions for opiate dependency, respiratory impairment, hepatic impairment, and a lot of the prisoners who are wanting opiates have got all three of those. Um, modified release preparations, I uh, don't know if you realise, if you crunch up um, DHC or similar, you get immediate release uh, opiates, which a lot of other prisoners do know. Don't know. 
Yeah, you probably can't read that too well. That's from the um, pain, pain management formulary. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's really, really important to read it. It just runs through as, as the RAG approach um, that Denise mentioned. Um, so if I, some, I've got someone in front of me wanting opiates. I review their symptoms misuse history. If it's an acute injury, and I think there's good grounds to give opiates, but they've got a history of symptoms misuse, they've a, appear to be opiate free, I'll warn them that's a risk of reigniting their opiate dependency. Um, if they still want opiates, um, and some will say, no, I don't want opiates, it's going to set me off again. If they do want opiates, and it's appropriate, I will prescribe them. Um, but I try to make sure that it's a limited duration and there's a there's an aim and that it's not going to be they're still on opiates for you know, their dislocated shoulder in six months' time. Um, persistent pain, it really should be long-acting opiates and there's a maximum dose of equivalent to morphine, 120 milligrams. Um, a lot of our prisoners want codeine rather than uh, methadone um, or dihydrocodeine rather than methadone. Um, I'll give morphine for um, persistent pain, but I'm really concerned about doing that where then someone's going to be released because um, they're not going to get supervised uh, MST or MXL in the community, and that may be a risk. Um, I'll normally try to prescribe paracetamol and non-steroidals before giving opiates. Um, a lot of prisoners, the pain formula stresses that you give paracetamol, then you add um, non-steroidals, um, and then you maybe add opiates on top of that. It's not a case of, right, well, if paracetamol doesn't work, I'd try something else and try something else. It's actually working up and building up the whole structure. Um, tramadol, really, really popular with opiate-dependent patients, as we know. Uh, we only prescribe it's modified release. It's a controlled drug. Um, and uh, since it's been a, a CD, um, we've had a lot lower number of patients coming in on it. Um, dihydrocodeine, we don't prescribe at all. Um, very, very popular with opiate-dependent patients. Um, do see some patients saying, oh, I want to come off my methadone, but uh, I'm going to have pain, can I have dihydrocodeine instead? Um, and it's a straight no with us. Oromorph, um, we don't use it at the moment. We've got to set up a palliative care bed, um, I think it's by September, and we're expected to be able to provide Oromorph and an open uh, door uh, policy. So we're looking at how we're going to manage both of those in our prison. Could be quite interesting. Uh, codeine. Very, very popular in the prison. Um, we audit, every month we audit our tradable meds and look at the codeine. I've got one guy who had gone out on limb and said, all right, okay, we'll give it to you longer term with it. And then he's intoxicated three times in a week, so he's now come off it. He's not happy, unfortunately, um, and he won't take any alternatives. Um, I said morphine, really think about is it safe for them to go out on MST? Methadone, you can use it for pain relief. The guidelines say it should only be used when pain emerges during a methadone reduction. Um, what I tend to get is when I offer to put their methadone dose back up, is they say, no, I don't want, don't want that. I'm trying to get off the stuff. It's evil stuff. I want to get off the methadone. Can't you give me some tramadol instead? And the answer to that is always a no. I wouldn't transfer them sideways on something more abusable. Um, fentanyl. Uh, Buprenorphine we don't prescribe for pain at all. The opioid patch is recommended not to uh, prescribe ditto with oxycodone. Yeah. <laughs> okay, gabapentinoids, um, same side as the star. Um, we're really, really cracking down on it. Almost all of our patients on pregabalin and gabapentin have history of some misuse. Um, uh, Catherine Glover is going to be doing a talk in um, one of the workshops later on. Catherine developed her policy at the same time as we developed ours. Mine was about, you fit it on one slide, um, no background details to it. Catherine did it much, much better. Um, our policy is if they've got a history of someone's misuse, they don't get um, gabapentinoids. If they've no history of um, someone's misuse, they may well get pregabalin and gabapentin if it appears to be clinically indicated, and we keep a really, really close eye on them. Um, so far, the majority of them will be given it in possession. Um, they've failed their spot checks and they've been taken off it. It's, it's so tempted to use, um, or they, you may make them very vulnerable to be, being abused to get the drugs off them. And they do increase the mortality of opiate users because they suppress the opiate tolerance um, and said they're more likely to die as a result. The, effect, the alternatives are as or more effective than um, gabapentinoids. 
Um, gamma pentanoids have been studied. It's not effective for sciatic, which is a common request for it. Um, it's not licensed for um, post robotic pain, venous ulcer pain, and back pain. If someone comes in and say, oh, I've got an injury there, injury there, and I've um, got a sore toe, to my mind, they're just describing scars. They're not describing neuropathic pain. It's unlikely that they've had all these different injuries causing neuropathic pain. Um, opinions do vary, and the prisoners often have a different opinion to me. Um, other prescribers are, not often, or are often not aware of the abuse potential and the risk of prescribing, and they may be unaware of the prisoner's substance misuse history. Um, pain clinicians, I went on one of the um, pain uh, training days down in London. Um, we actually had a pain clinician facilitating on our table. He didn't tell us a pain clinician until the end when he was giving his feedback. And he said he was really depressed to hear that he was the uh, villain, not the, um, the good boy. Um, and actually, it was great. He actually learned that what he was doing was causing a lot of problems. Um, so often, you get hold of the letters from the pain clinics or the orthopedic surgeons who've advocated it. There's no mention about some misuse, and it doesn't appear that they were aware of it. Um, we virtually never initiate a gamma pentanoid in prison. Um, and normally we're aiming to reduce it off if prescribed in the community, and we do link in with the uh, community GPs. Benzos, um, probably don't need to say anything about benzos. I'm sure we all, all know it at uh, nauseam, and it's a lot rarer um, drug to find in prisons now than um, gabapentinoids. Um, we used to get them coming to Forest Bank and um, with positive dr um, drug screens, and I suspect in a lot of cases, they were just getting um, a benzodiazepine off the forensic GP in police custody, then presenting the positive drug screen to get no, um, a benzo and or alcohol detox. Um, if they've got a persisting UDS at reception, we check them again a few weeks later on. If it's still positive, we're saying, right, you're using benzos, and we look at their other medication to see if it's safe. Um, illicit benzodiazepine users rarely need a detox, um, and the majority of ones are saying, oh, I'm using 200 milligrams a day. I've not seen any of them personally presenting with benzodiazepine withdrawals in, in the prison. Clonazepam, a bit more problematic. It's licensed for epilepsy, um, but see the NICE guidelines for it. Um, my neurologist insists it's not for monotherapy use um, and should only be uh, prescribed by a neurologist, um, probably at a tertiary centre, um, and it's probably inappropriate. Um, as at a... Um, RCGP uh, review on managing OTC medications a few years back now, and we went through all about clonazepam, how dreadful it was not to prescribe it. And there was a GP stood up there and said, Oh, right, I'm epileptic, and the only drug that works for me is clonazepam. So there may be our exceptions there, but we wanted to drug test her. <laughs> um, okay, if there's current alcohol or drug misuse or respiratory suppression, it is contraindicated. So if you've got those issues there, fully it's appropriate to stop it. Um, if there's cautions there, again, and to my mind, with clonazepam, unless there's really, really concrete evidence that it is the only drug that will work for them, then maybe go ahead and stop it. Um, remember how potent it is compared with clonazepam. Um, it's, I have had conversations years past with a colleague who's saying, oh, they're only on two milligrams, and didn't realize that was 40 milligrams of clonazepam. Um, we get the information from the neurologist, and we're fortunate we've got a really, really good in-reach neurologist who totally agrees with me. Um, if he thinks it's a risk, he will say, right, they're coming off. There's no doubt about it. Um, and he puts it very, very clearly and succinctly to the patients. Antihistamines. Um, we regard sedating antihistamines as sleeping tablets, and so do our prisoners. And we don't use um, pyroton and the like. Um, we use um, cetirizine uh, usually. Um, Dirty Sprite is something I've only recently come across. It's a combination of um, periton and codeine linked us. Not quite sure how much of the two you need, but you mix it up, you drink it, and apparently it gives you quite a hit. And I think it's maybe hallucinogenic. Um, I've, had, I've not had any patients admit to trying it, and I do wonder what happens to the antihistamines we prescribe in prison, along with the codeine we prescribe, can they be doing the same thing? Um, we've had some feedback recently about cetirizine in high dose being used in sleeping tablets, um, especially when they're getting a month supply. Um, and the hay fever seems to have started in February, it's always a bit curious. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> 
Um, we push the steronasal spray because that's actually the recommendations now as first line treatment. Um, and the genuine patients are actually often quite surprised that it does work better for them than their antihistamines. Um, antispasmodics, uh, methocarbol and baclofen, they're psychoactive, sedating and abused. Uh, we keep getting patients trickling through to us who are on it for back pain. Um, and we say, no, it's not appropriate for that condition. Um, they've all got a history of substance misuse as well, which may be coincidental. Um, Buscapan, it's apparently being abused, apparently it's psychoactive when it's smoked. We don't prescribe it and I haven't seen it coming across our way for quite a while now. Buspirone is licensed for short-term anxiety. I've seen it um, used quite high doses and I'm not quite sure what it does. It's psychoactive and we do tend to get odd patients to find it really, really nice and are very, very driven to have it. Um, we normally say, right, okay, well, it's short-term use, let's get you moving on and coming off it, and we tend not to use it at all. ADHD meds. Uh, there's new nice guidelines out, which I've read. Um, in Cumbria, we don't have an adult ADHD service, so I've no real experience of it. We won't accept prisoners on it because we would have to take them off the um, med medication concerto, etc., because we've no one to oversee it. Um, the guidelines, the new guidelines do say it should be healthcare professionals with training and expertise in diagnosing and managing it that are prescribing it. Um, so we're ruled out with that at the moment, we're getting new mental health uh, providers soon, and that may change. Um, but certainly look at... It um, Sorry? It won't. <laughs> Good, glad to hear it. Um, look at it in your own prisons. The medications are potentially abused. Um, there's an all, awful lot of prisoners claim to have ADHD. Um, I've always thought that a lot of prisoners will present and say, oh, like they've got a bookshelf behind them, and I've got PTSD, and bipolar, and psychosis, oh, uh, and what else? Oh, it's ADHD as well. And it's like they're pulling the diagnosis off a bookshelf. Um, sometimes get quite interesting, you have to say, well, tell me more about your um, psychosis, what's it like? Well, I hear voices, well, tell me about them. No, I don't want to talk about it, or they're very, very vague. Um, I'm not a psychiatrist, I don't know how to tell when someone's telling porkies or not about hearing voices, I pass them on to mental health and psychiatry to play with. ADHD meds have the awareness and just you know, look at what's happening. One minute. Okay, build up drinks we've discussed briefly, um, we virtually never prescribe them. Um, I don't think we prescribe them at all in the four years I've been at HP Havrig. Uh, a lot of people come in with an, a low BMI. I look at the prison records and go back through on System 1. Actually, yeah, his BMI is only 18, but he's been 18 for the last six years. This isn't an acute illness problem. This is normal for them. Um, the recommendations are to give dietary supplements first. As I say, most of them end up by selling their supplements. Um, we, we never really prescribe it. You can get an adrenaline rush, rush off salbutamol, apparently, if you take a high dose. And of course, the casings are used to smoke drugs. Um, EpiPen, we discussed earlier. Okay. Anyone disagree strongly, please say. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, I think you're right about the cost basis there. I mean, that, that was the nice basis for uh, not recommending it, wasn't it? Um, it's, our routine is to go away from the gabapentinoids simply because of the, the abuse potential there. Um, I suspect a lot of people who are on it are taking it as a sleeping tablet, and that's why I think it's interesting that nortriptyline doesn't work for them. Um, and it's quite amusing when they come in and say, oh, this nortriptyline doesn't work, and presume the second half of the sentence was going to be, can I go back on time trip sleep? So I just say, right, well, we'll stop it before they get the chance. Um, and that's sparked a few conversations. On the um, red amber green um, tablet, nortriptyline isn't recommended, does it? Mm. There's a cost, that's to the cost in the drug tariff. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what the RCGP come up with on their new yeah. prison prescribing. If someone's on clonazepam for epilepsy and they're using it illicitly, so you can perfectly justify to them reduce it and wean it. If you think it's, it's unsafe to prescribe a drug and you carry on prescribing it, I think that's a significant risk. And if you're in front of the coroner's after that conversation, um, I think it'd be quite interesting. Um, I think if you're providing um, adequate alternative medication and possibly with neurology support, um, then certainly go down that what route. Do it depends on the risk. Um, it's switching it to diazepam may be an easy way to do it, um, especially if you think it's abuse rather than um, anticonvulsant. Really, really worth looking to see if they've got a history of epilepsy. So when I've looked through it, um, the majority of them there isn't a clear indication. Unfortunately, if you go along to see a consult a neurologist and say, hi, this is what happens to me. I'm having these seizures and my girlfriend described them to me. You've got epilepsy, even if all the tests are negative. And that means that any, any of them can present and say, I've got epilepsy. Well, just on that point, one of the bits of advice we had from one of our neurologists was that it's very dangerous to prescribe clonazepam because it increases the benzo tolerance. So therefore, if they need benzos in status, the risk is they're going to experience depression. So on a pure safety basis, he said we should never, ever prescribe clonazepam, because if they do need to have rebel diazepam, you could end up killing them. Especially, if, you know, we know that it's 20 times as strong as diazepam, so I put that every time and it seems to work. Sounds good, yeah. Um, we've probably got lots of questions about this, but we do need to crack on. Can I just, um, can everyone give Rob a clap? Thank you.